The Proper Word, Volume 1, Issue 6, A Reason to Prepare. There was once a great error committed against a doctrine of the Apostle Paul that caused a terrible earthquake in the Roman Gentile churches. Paul spoke on the second appearing of Christ from the clouds. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he taught. But this was not his only work. When the reward for disobeying the Ten Commandments of God, and especially the commandment of controversy, his seventh day Sabbath, his fourth commandment, and also the required experience to know the God of those commandments according to the required soul-afflicting experience in the midst of this judgment, the dead in Christ shall rise first, Paul taught. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Lord will destroy the ones most rebellious against honoring every commandment of God along with the rejectors of the message of soul mercy for complete recovery, and many righteous individuals who have been dead for ages, and those who are then alive at that time, will receive a new fashion, and will literally ascend up to Christ in that moment. They will then pick up a new work in His presence after they have rejoiced and celebrated with Him. This celebration is a blessed occasion, for the Spirit says, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, this blessed occasion revolves around Christ finally securing to himself his wife. John records, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The bride, the Lamb's wife, she is that great city, the holy Jerusalem. But it should be remembered that a wedding feast means nothing without the ceremony. The feast cannot begin until the man and the woman are officially given to one another. So when did Christ enter into a wedding? This wedding began when it was fulfilled, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. This same prophecy is recorded for us in another way. The Lord whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Christ coming before the Father marks his appearance to a temple, and the temple that he should enter fulfills the saying, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat temple of God has two veils or doors. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. God the Father was only literally found within the room of the second veil, for he, in the form of a cloud, was found above the ark that held the Ten Commandments. The high priest was not allowed into this room but once every year. Christ's appearance before the Father, the Ancient of Days, signifies His movement into this room. It is in this room that His marriage ceremony is today taking place. Christ picked up Aaron's priesthood when the Father resurrected him from the grave. This is why it says, Christ glorified not Himself to be made an high priest, but He that said unto Him, Thou art my Son, today have I begotten Thee. What existed on earth by Aaron was but a pattern of the ministry of Christ that was to come after. What existed on earth was to find its true fulfillment by Christ in heaven. Therefore, we may confidently know that Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Having now been anointed of God to be the apostle and high priest of our profession, he began to do the work of the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. This work ended when Christ entered into the second tabernacle to there accomplish that service of God. The prophet was told in relation to the time that revealed the events concerning the grand change of divine ministration, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. The weeks are better understood to be weeks of years. Because there are seven days in a week, if we multiply seven by the seventy weeks, 
we will arrive at the full time spoken of. We arrive at 490 weeks, or rather, years. The angel was telling Daniel that 490 years were allotted to his people for certain events to be fulfilled. These events would begin with a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, 457 B.C., and these events would end when Christ shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, that is, for seven days or seven years. A.D. 27, Christ was baptized of God. Three and a half years later brings us to 31 A.D., his crucifixion and ascension to a new name and appointment of God over the heavenly house and church of God. Three and a half years from 31 A.D., fulfilling the full seven years of his ministry carried out by his apostles to the Jews, brings us to 34 A.D. With the prophecy of the 70 weeks completed, and with the time now at 34 A.D., because this prophecy of the 70 weeks begins that grand prophecy of 2300 years, if we take the 49, if we take the 490 years and the 2300 years and subtract them, 2300 from 490, we are left with 1810 years remaining within the 2300 year prophecy. When these 1810 years should expire, their expiration marks a change in Christ's administration. Again, if we should add the 1810 years with 34 AD, we arrive at the date of expiration, even at 1844 AD. This date, 1844 AD, marks the movement of Christ to receive his bride, that heavenly city of God. Christ is entered into the second room of the heavenly temple and he is today fulfilling a new work and ministry to God in this room for the future citizens of that city and the new earth and heaven that will surround her. Thus, today, the Father says to any soul who feels after his Christ, all things are ready, come unto the marriage. Matthew 22 verse 4 Everyone professing to hold some affection for the Christ of God is to join him in this room today and is to know the full faith of God that is in this room. From the, movement, from the moment Christ entered into this apartment, the Ancient of Days did sit, the judgment was set, and the books were opened. This prophecy fulfills the saying, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. It is His judgment that began when Christ changed from one heavenly apartment to the other, and this judgment is an investigative judgment. Christ is still our High Priest. He cannot be both judge and priest, for that is not His job description. God the Father is the one who is making up the guests of his son's wedding, and this fact is drawn out by what Christ said. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. The son is his Christ, and the king is his father. The investigation is to see who will be faithful to him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things therein. This is an investigation to see who will honor the one that counsels, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Or entrance into the second room is highlighted by the fact that the seventh day Sabbath of God must return to the heritage of God. Because Christ is in this room that magnifies the Father. Obedience to the voice and blood of the Son is the only means to reconcile the faithful spirit to the God and Creator of that Spirit. Today, and for many years now, we have been living under a heavenly wedding service. If we profess to love the Lord, should we miss it? Should we not rather confess with John, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Should we fail of receiving an entrance before him, what is the joy of rejoicing with our Lord worth when compared to our stubbornness, to our faithlessness, to our unwillingness to personally examine Scripture, to our fear, to our lack of fortitude to draw out the soul to Him alone in His presence? Christ was speaking to us today when He said, Let your loins be girt about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when He shall return from the wedding, that when He cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately.
Christ's return from the wedding is when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, when he has a faithful host who will obey every charge of God and who will examine every law of God to place it in its proper context by his Spirit, he will then come for his host, not until his members are sealed with his Father's name from experiencing his Father's religion for them, will he close this second room to let what else should occur take place. I have mentioned these things because in Paul's day, there were many forging his name and the other names of the apostles to letters and to documents that taught that the second coming of Christ was then taking place, and that a particular sect that supposedly shot out of the apostles was his choice kingdom on the earth for protection from his rage. Paul warns against these things by saying, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The fact that Paul says, when referring to the presented materials of these people, that the letters were instruments, in quotes, as from us, testifies to the corrupt spirit working in the Roman churches. If something is as from something else, then that thing drawn from that something is but fraudulent. History teaches that the elders of the Gentile Christian churches were in fact writing codes and ethics for their faith in order to gain supporters. To gain their members, they added the name of whichever apostle pleased them. But why may these people have believed that the times they were living in declared the apparent coming of Christ? They saw individuals inside of Rome and without as being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. This was literally the condition of Rome that Paul describes. Luther himself once said of Rome, it is almost incredible what sins and infamous actions are committed at Rome. One would require to see and hear it in order to believe it. Hence, it is an ordinary saying that if there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. It is an abyss from whence all sins proceed. Without contemplating the doctrines of the apostles, the Gentile churches and their leaders took their voice literally. Paul was not simply describing the state of the present popular culture, but was confessing to them the spirit that he saw within pagan priesthoods and their citizens, which spirit he was beginning to see within them that professed Christ. The elders' refusal to understand the sayings of the apostles caused them to create philosophical doctrines that produced fear to maintain membership within their churches. The historian Edward Gibbon writes, The careless polytheist, assailed by new and unexpected terrors, against which neither his priest nor his philosophers could afford him any certain protection, was very frequently terrified and subdued by the menace of eternal tortures. His fears might assist the progress of his faith and reason, and if he could once persuade himself to suspect that the Christian religion, Catholic religion, might possibly be true, it became an easy task to convince him that it was the safe and most prudent way that he should possibly embrace. Whilst the happiness and glory of a temporal reign were promised to the disciples of Christ, the most dreaded calamities were denounced against an unbelieving world. Though it might not be universally received, it appears to have been the reigning sentiment of the orthodox believers, and it seems so well adapted to the desires and apprehensions of mankind that it must have contributed in a very considerable degree to the progress of the Christian faith. Doctrines began to be preached that were contrary to the fact even while the apostles were alive. By fear, the elders secured great wealth, and their ambition cost them the benefit of the intended purpose of God. Paul knew the mind behind certain men, and this is why he counseled, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. 
Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Paul had already revealed the fact of the matter to the church of the Thessalonians. Many great events would need to be fulfilled before Christ could literally execute what he should execute against them that are contrary to God, and before he could have a perfect host gathered unto him to be presented to his Father. Before any of this should take place, a falling away within the Roman church is needed to take place. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, Paul taught. Herein Paul describes two agencies at work, namely, he who lets, or he who serves to continue, which is the same one who is to be taken out of the way or removed, and the mystery of iniquity, that wicked, the son of perdition. Their fall revolved around these two influences, that is, the fall of the Christian church. He who should be taken out of the way fulfills the saying, by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. Daniel 8.11 The daily is better understood to be the full system of paganism which began in Babylon and found itself within Rome as the state religion of Rome. It was pagan Rome that Paul referred to when he said, You know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Daniel says, By him, paganism was taken away. And the him referred to as that son of perdition. Paul says, You know what keeps back that wicked that institution of iniquity, that he, that strange institution, might be revealed in his time. And that which restrained the progress of terrible apostasy was that system of paganism carried out by tradition in Rome. When it says the daily was taken away, in reality it means that paganism was magnified in worship by this new Roman entity. Therefore, when the time came to officially reveal that perverted institution to the world, Many of the Lord's true servants beheld the image and prayed, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Psalms 94, verse 20. Pagan Rome became papal Rome. Because pagan Rome is symbolized by a dragon in the Revelation, at this time the word was fulfilled. They worshipped the dragon, the sentiments of paganism, which gave power unto the beast, the papacy. And they worshipped the beast. Paganism was fully worshipped under an apostate Christian garb. Daniel saw the work of these two gross entities, paganism from Babylon to Rome, and then papal paganism in Rome. And growing curious at when they should quit their reign on the earth and when the Lord should recover souls from them, he was made to hear a certain conversation between two angels who had knowledge of their careers. I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, records the prophet, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. During these twenty three hundred days, Paganism within the empire of the Medes and Persians, within Greece and within pagan and papal Catholicism, within Rome would flourish. But at the end of the days, the Lord would draw the eye of faith back to himself and to that place where he was to be for the health of every eye. Under his new administration, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. Christ is currently in the heavenly temple, and more specifically, within the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven, the most holy place. He stands before the Father and pleads His blood for us, that we may experience the benefit bestowed from obeying His voice through His Spirit. Today, the Father is making up His house for His eternal country, and is refining a peculiar people for a regenerated earth and heaven, and cares that not one soul should be left out. The saying is forever true. The darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Christ's entrance into the second department destroys Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Titus 1, 14 For example, 
for centuries. The papacy pretended it the papacy pretended its priesthood to be that priesthood of God. The new sight of Christ under a new administration obliterates that weightless claim. Catholicism's pretended Sunday feast is destroyed by the new appointment of Christ, for the true and blessed seventh day of God now shines forth to his host. A new reign and a new and more personal experience blessed by both the Father and his high priest began 1844 A.D. Let us by faith enter into the place where he currently is, that we may know him, and that we may be present at the time appointed to celebrate with him and with our family, after he has forever quenched every contrary spirit. Part 2 The Corners of Moab it was once prophesied of the Christ of God, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. He who left the heavenly abode of the living God to dwell on earth in human flesh is the same one blessed of God to be that unbreakable bond between humanity and his divine economy. There is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And it is this Christ that came to confess the loveliness of his Father for mankind and to establish a new dispensation of perfection by active faith in the power of his blood and spirit. But ignoring the many facts behind this prophecy and the many reasons behind his mission on earth, we turn our attention to how it says, and shall smite the corners of Moab. The prophet reveals to us a work that the doctrine of Christ was to accomplish and that work cements the downfall of Moab. If anything is smitten or struck on the corners, then it is evident that what is on top of that surface and what those corners support will be so afflicted and grieved as to fall through. Such an image provokes the sentiment, the foundations of the earth do shake, and her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down. The corners of Moab are the foundations of Moab, the strength of her practice, and a major work of Christ was to destroy the wall between Moab and the Jews and to usher in one union under the order of the government of the living God in heaven. Having been estranged from right and reasonable heaven-appointed religion, Moab subscribed to a God that he honored as the Hebrew God, but it was not the living God. It is written, O Moab, the people of Chemosh, and then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh the abomination of Moab. Moab's God was called Chemosh, and although to Moab he was known by this name, to various pagan heritages he went by different names, but still found place within the same sun god. Christ appeared on this earth to do what the Jews had failed to do, that is, to let every single inhabitant of the earth, Jew and pagan, know about the living God. Every set of people on this planet served what they knew not in the most grotesque fashion, and it was Christ who was to gather the entire human race under the banner of loyalty to the living Father, the historian writes, concerning the state of the world at the time of Christ's birth, all nations lived in the practice of the most abominable superstitions. For though the notion of one supreme being was not entirely effaced in the human mind, but showed itself frequently, even through the darkness of the grossest idolatry, yet all nations except that of the Jews acknowledged a number of governing powers whom they called gods, and one or more of which they supposed to preside over each particular province of people. There was no nation whose sacred rites and whose religious worship did not discover a manifest abuse of reason and very striking marks of extravagance and folly. While the pagan world lay in confusion, the Jews themselves were scattered from a right understanding on heavenly things. The historian continues, the state of the Jews was not much better than that of the other nations at the time of Christ's appearing in the world. All regarded the whole of religion as consisting in rites appointed by Moses and in the performance of some external acts of duty towards the Gentiles. The supercilious teachers, who vaunted their profound knowledge of the law and their deep science in spiritual and divine things, were constantly showing their fallibility and their ignorance by their religious differences, and were divided into a great variety of sects. 
The internal and the external religion of the Jews was submerged under pagan philosophy, and the historian notes that it is certain that the, that the ancestors of those Jews who lived in the time of our Savior had brought from Chaldea and the neighboring countries many extravagant and idle fancies which were utterly known to the original founders of the nation, which were utterly unknown to the original founders of the nation. Christ literally carried the full weight of the error of the world to God on his shoulders, and he put the government of God on the line when he appeared to execute his divine will in human flesh for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Christ's victory over the flesh while in the flesh is ours to take hold of and to study after for its perfect completion in us. He died for the laws that regulate the earth and every single human being on it. The Ten Commandments It is purposed of God that these same Ten Commandments would find place within the human being by none other agent than His Spirit. For then, what is engraved within the soul temple is permanently fixed to stabilize the being after death to self is accepted. To gather the world to himself, the Father instituted a law to pull the willing soul to him. He said, A law shall proceed from me. Isaiah 51 4. This law was to come out of the Ten Commandments to draw its subject to know the God of those commandments, that they may then keep every one of those precepts in truth with all their heart and with all their soul. Thus, when Christ came to this earth, he appeared to fulfill the word. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Christ would bless the commandments of his Father by fully observing every one of them. The fact that he is the anointed of God heightens the responsibility of anyone confessing love to him to uphold the same precepts that, he, that, to uphold the same precepts that brought him joy to keep. He is the one and only beloved of the living God, and must anyone believe that they may honor the Christ of God while yet dishonoring him that sent him? And further, because he is the only high priest over the house of God, and because this priesthood is ordained for the service of God, must anyone claim Christ as their Savior and intercessor without being mindful of the one he intercedes before? Christ's resurrection and new appointed position in the presence of God destroys the foundation of Moab. The terrible nature of the religion of Moab is irrelevant, but the main point of every pagan superstition that brought it into one fold is important. Each nation and tribe of people carried on with what they did, and they subscribed to the same God, even though the name differed among many cultures, but the majority held the same day of worship to that God. This day of service to the sun God found its way in Israel, and in Christ's life, he saw Jews honoring the living God while pledging, while pledging themselves before the God worshipped by every pagan nation. But his death and new name sealed an escape from philosophical sophistry. Faithful obedience to the experience of reformation and regeneration is to kill within the person every false error of service. But because many after the death of Christ and after the death of his first apostles did not entertain the depth of his sayings, nor did they give themselves over to a right education by the Spirit. Pagan culture began to mix with the sayings of Christ, and a new and strange religion sprung up on the earth. Eventually this sect would boldly step away from the one law that was to separate it as an emblem of God, his seventh-day Sabbath. The historian writes, Early in the Christian era, a new form of heathen worship sprang up and spread rapidly throughout the then Gentile world. It was known as Mithraism, and had to do with the worship of the sun as did other forms of heathenism, but its philosophy was more fascinating than the more crude form of paganism and made a pretense of holding up high standards of morality. This new heathenism soon captured the Caesars invaded the Roman armies and the centers of learning, and was embraced by the higher classes of society. Alexandria and Rome soon became important to Mithran centers, and, in fact, history records that in the middle of the third century, Mithraism seemed on the verge of becoming the universal religion, and that it became the greatest antagonist of Christianity. Some of the peculiar doctrines enunciated 
by its priests were the immortality of the soul, the use of bell and candle, holy water and communion, sanctification of Sunday, and the 25th of December. The devotees of Mithra held Sunday sacred because Mithra was identified with the invincible sun. They held Sunday sacred and celebrated the birth of the sun on the 25th of December. There soon set in a life and death struggle between Mithraism and Christianity, and since apostasy was already rife in the Christian church, it was only a short step further for her leaders to agree upon a compromise. Many of these leaders had themselves come into the church as converts from Mithraism and still had a certain veneration for the sun and those institutions held sacred to it. It was therefore agreed by them that, in order to facilitate the conversion of the heathen, and thus advocate the cause of Christ over that of Mithra, they would incorporate many of the teachings and institutions of Mithraism into the church, and among these was the Sunday festival. On this point we have the following striking testimony of the Catholic world published in 1894. The church took the pagan philosophy and made it the buckler of faith against the heathen. She took the pagan Roman pantheon, temple of all the gods, and made it sacred to all the martyrs. So it stands to this day. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday. She took the pagan Easter and made it the feast we celebrate during this season. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is, in truth, something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of justice. Hence the church in these centuries would seem to have said, Keep that old pagan name. It shall remain consecrated, sanctified. And thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, the god of light and peace, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus. Christ has reconciled all things to his Father, and what separates his reconciled seed from the religious world is his sign of authority. After creation, God sealed the power of his creative voice with a memorial. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because it was God who created all things by Jesus Christ, just as Christ finished creation and ordained a Sabbath for the seventh day, this same Jesus ordains that the same seventh day Sabbath for his new creature, who, after God, is created in righteousness, and true holiness. The creation of God is not without his seventh day Sabbath. It was not so in the beginning, and today his blessed seventh day is not without the heart created by him. His creation experiences the power of his creative voice to form in them a new spirit from a heart void of thought and feeling, experiencing the certainty behind his voice and exercising faith to behold the Lord of their dearest affection they are blessed to be taught by the Spirit and to receive power for self-development, and are also given the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith. Romans 4, 11. We are all naturally disobedient. We ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But this does not have to continue to be our current condition. There is a remedy. There is an experience that we may receive in order to heal our character deficiencies. No one has to be held under fear or ignorance or whatever may be troubling the being anymore. Christ has condemned sin in the flesh. And this means that the flesh may now find sin disgusting. A mind pained to commit error and willing to die so that the taste of error may never revive is a blessed mind. It is not natural to care to sincerely exist apart from the natural human mind, and it is even less honorable to allow the heart and life to conform to his divine pattern and instruction. But the transition is made light by the promise. They shall be all taught of God. John six forty five. It is the Spirit of God that will perfect love, and that will add intelligence to the affection had for God. He will teach. The reformer will grow up in Christ from that education. 
and the knowledge retained will give life to the eye for the destruction of every fallacy that exists. Or entrant into the seventh day Sabbath reveals a true education under the wings of Christ. Hear the psalmist. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. To individuals who are diligently obeying the truth through the Spirit, a banner will be given them to testify to their acceptance of the experience within the Spirit. Christ offered himself that the entire world may stand under one banner, and that banner magnifies the name and the fame of the living God. The corners of Moab are destroyed, and the light of God exposes the heritage of falsehood. If God is light, then everything standing without God is darkness, and is without God. Christ delivered a blow to the sun-worshipping superstitions of the world that will never heal, and although many have attached his name to error, and without considering that by doing so they openly admit that they perceive error in him, and are therefore enemies of his. No thing may ever change the fact that his voice decreed a memorial for his faithful seed, and that whosoever, and that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it, that men should fear before him. Ecclesiastes three, fourteen. If we love him, Restrain not the heart from feeling after him. I will end by a few words from another historian. Perhaps it will be proper at this point to introduce the testimony of Neander, the greatest of church, Catholic church historians. This German author speaks as follows of Sunday observance in the early church. The festival of Sunday, like all other festivals, was always only a human ordinance, and it was far from the intention of the apostles to establish a divine command in this respect, far from them and from the early apostolic church, to transfer the laws of the Sabbath to Sunday. Perhaps at the end of the second century a false application of this kind had begun to take place, for men appear by that time to have considered laboring on Sunday as a sin. This statement truly gives the origin of Sunday observance. It was purely voluntary, standing solely upon human authority. Sir William Domville states the fact that not any ecclesiastical writer of the first three centuries attributed the origin of Sunday observance either to Christ or to his apostles.